um, the museum to make things accessible to folks, whether they're here in person, online, um, or in the future. So uh, we're really excited to have everybody here at the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience today to hear from Annabelle Gerwich. Um, and thank you so much, Annabelle, for being here uh, to present to this group and to our community online as well. Um, what's gonna happen today is we're gonna hear uh, from Annabelle and then we're gonna um, have some questions both from folks online, have folks online and from folks here. Um, something that often happens is folks come in um, and they make a little bit of noise, but we'll do our best to make sure everybody's quiet and respectful. Um, folks online, you're gonna remain muted the whole time. Sorry about that. Um, and you can ask your questions in the chat and we will ask them here. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Annabelle Gerwich. She's an actress, activist, and New York Times bestseller of, I see you made an effort, wherever you go, there they are. You can say tomato, I say shut up, and fired, um, which is also a Showtime comedy special. She's written for the New York Times, um, the New Yorker, Los Angeles Times, Oprah Magazine, the Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Magazine, and Hadassah Magazine. Very, Very Hadassah. Um, I am a proud member of Hadassah, <laughs> so I might have gotten your magazine. Uh, her Los Angeles Times op-ed about hosting at hosting an at-risk housing insecure couple in her home was recognized with the, with the 2020 Los Angeles Press Club Excellence in Journalism Award. Gerwich was the longtime co-host of Dinner and Movie on TBS, a regular NPR commentator, a host of Wasted for the Doc Discovery Channel. Acting credits include Seinfeld, Dexter, and Melvin Goes to Dinner. Pre-pandemic, pre she performed on the Moth main stage and at art centers around the country. Gerwich thought she'd be an empty nester by now. Instead, she lives with her cats and a child, a, a college graduate of the COVID class of 2020 in Los Angeles. She co-hosts the Tiny Victories podcast, which Vulture called a bright spot of light and laughter in 2020. Without further ado, I'd like to in introduce Annabelle Gerwich. Thank you so much, Lizzie. I'm gonna put this somehow anchoring this on my, my top here this is a very sexy move uh i might need i'm gonna take a moment to put this here okay now i'm wearing a very low cut top i hope it doesn't become even more low cut first of all it's so exciting to be here uh if it's your first time at the museum take a look around it's such an extraordinary history of the southern Jewish experience of the immigrant experience of Jews in the South. And, you know, it used to be the kind of thing, I think we're, we're getting more on the map. It, it's, you know, uh, there, a few years back when I would say I was a Jewish person from the South, people would regularly say, I didn't know there were Jews in the South. Um, I think we've come a long way with things like the Lamian trilogy on Broadway. And I have been compelled to tell the story. And why am I compelled to tell the story? And why is this museum so important? You know, when I walk around the museum and when I think about my own Southern history as a Jewish person and the immigrant experience, I think about how it must have been for my ancestors coming here from the old country in the late 1800s, coming to America, and they were part of the wave of Eastern European Jews, not the wealthy Eastern, not the wealthy uh, Austro-Hungarian Austria set of Jews who came here with a lot of advantages. My family were shtetl people who mostly, you know, the, if we had a family crest, it would be a potato and a wheelbarrow <laughs> and a Jewish star, a Kiddush cup. Uh, but, uh, you know, so we, we really came here with so few advantages and we were marginalized in many ways because of our small numbers in the South and the story of how we managed, thrived, supported our, us as, or supported our group as a community and then expanded that sense of responsibility to this new country into great amounts of philanthropy and community action that 
inspires me. That's part of my motivation in life is to take the responsibility of my ancestors. And so walking around, it, it's just so excited to see this story being told and to be a part of spreading this message. You know, and when I walked around, I think all of us who share this history or even from our own, whatever our, because we're most, most of us are immigrants in America, will relate to different things. I was just looking at one part of the early history about how challenging it was for Jews from Eastern Europe to adjust to the diet in this part of the world. I mean, can you imagine? You've come, I mean, the landscape itself, the heat, the humidity, it gets me every time. I mean, every single day. Coming from Russia, coming from that environment and finding yourselves here. Uh, and my first relatives came along the Mississippi. We, I was born in Alabama and Mobile, and that's where it became our family base. But first we were in Louisiana, furriers along the Mississippi. And coming from the old country, and finding yourself here, in this heat, in this humidity, in this landscape. And then the food, <laughs> I mean, you know, my, this is a story on the wall about the struggle of whether or not to continue, you know, as many, many families came from Orthodox um, communities, which my family did. So my great grandmother, Rose, uh, had been raised in a kosher household and this is, how, this is how you become an American. So they kept kosher, except <laughs> you can't cook collard greens without bacon, <laughs> except, you know, you land here in the Gulf Coast and, and, and the shellfish coming from a staple diet of potatoes, the shellfish was impossible to, to ignore. So in our family lore is that every time great grandma Rose ate shellfish, she'd say a prayer and say, God, forgive me, which is why everyone thought she was a very religious person. <laughs> but, you know, I have this visceral reaction when I come back to this part of the country because I live in LA, I lived in New York after leaving the South and something about like when I'm in the plane and I start saying, Oh, we're coming over Slidell. We're coming over Lake Punch Train, coming towards New Orleans. And I, I get this, I, I feel like there's like an epigenetic memory in my cells because of my family's long history there. And because of the stories my dad told me growing up, you know, I've always, I've never done that, uh, DNA testing, the, what is it, 23andMe, but I've always thought it would probably say 50% Ashkenazi Jew, 50% gumbo. i absolutely convinced there is, my bones are made of gumbo because no one in my family was really a great cook, which was kind of hilarious that I ended up on dinner in a movie doing this show on TBS for seven years cooking. It was a big joke in my family because I never learned to cook. And it's actually really sad to me that I missed the opportunity to learn to make my dad's gumbo. But of course, it, it, was, it wasn't just a recipe. And I don't think he actually had a recipe. It was just something that was passed along in our family. And it took days. And in fact, it, it became one of those sort of signs as hallmarks that my father was aging when he didn't make his own roux from scratch. It's like, oh, okay, now we know, now we know things are changing. Um, but, you know, beyond the fact that when I land here and I hear the draw and which somehow gloms on back to me very quickly, um, which always sounds like home to me, you know, and, all my life as an adult, the funny thing too is I think is I've always, when I've met people out in the, out in the wide world uh, who have that Southern accent, I immediately feel close to them. Like my friend, Linda Thurman, who's here today, who I met in New York when I moved to New York when I was 18 and I immediately recognized that Louisiana accent and we became fast friends. Uh, 
there's something about that that always sounds like home to me. And when I emailed my friend Jody Markell, who's an actress who grew up in Memphis, who I also met in New York, and I just remember when I met her in a group of theater people, and I heard that accent, and I went, like, "Oh, an another another Southerner," you know. Um, she emailed and she said, "Oh, you know, it's just." not everyone understands that that southern jewish history my mother she said was like a, a southern belle and a jewish mother and i said oh i get it i completely get it and i think it's because the two identities are so strong that it makes for such a specific history and i do feel this you know deep connection to this part of the country and my um sister and I and some of my cousins, we have this little thread we call the Girl Witch Girls thread. And sometimes I, we, we just will write a text to each other and we'll say, we can't believe we're just, we're just little girls from Mobile. We came from such a small town. All of us are scattered across the country. And I, and I just want to say that I am the least accomplished of all the Girl Witch Girls. My sister, Lisa Gerwitch, is my guiding force in life. She's um, for 18 years, she was um, first the um, assistant director and then the director of the Jewish Community Endowment in San Francisco. She was the CEO of Delivering Good, one of the leading charities in the world. And now she has returned to the Jewish world as a director of advancement of the Joint Distribution Committee known as the Joint, which is operates in 40 or 70 countries, I can't remember, a lot of countries. And just uh, two weeks ago, she was standing on the border of Poland and Ukraine greeting refugees. And this is, this is one of the things you do when you come from an immigrant family. You honor that legacy and you reach back. And this is, you know, one of the reasons that, you know, beyond the gumbo, beyond this accent, beyond having mothers and grandmothers who remind us of a combination of uh, Blanche Dubois and, and the ultimate Jewish mother, you know, it's this legacy of our immigrant experience that has informed so much of my life in my latest book, in this new book, uh, I'm always writing about somehow or another stories about growing up in the South and this legacy of our being a small community of Jews making our way in a part of the country where we really were in, even, even if it was just marginalized by numbers, we were a small group. Um, it, it influences all of my work and my life. Uh, I'm going to be reading a piece of some stories from an earlier book, wherever you go, there they are, about my family's early history in this part of the country. But I wanted to talk about this book because um, this is my latest book, which is just out in paperback that we have copies of here. Uh, but the centerpiece of this book is about when I inadvertently signed up to open my home and house youth experiencing homelessness. Now, when I originally signed up for this program, I thought unhoused youth meant foreign exchange students. <laughs> I didn't mean, I didn't know it, it meant people experiencing homelessness. But as I learned about the program and I became the seventh person in Los Angeles to participate in what was then a nascent program, I thought about my family's history and I thought about the Jewish idea of welcoming the stranger and how we are compelled to welcome the stranger because we were once strangers in the land of Egypt, but then even more specifically about the Jewish immigrant experience. And I'm going to read you a little bit about why I ended up feeling compelled to participate in that program. What happened was the night before they moved in, you know, I was sure I'd been matched with this couple who'd been living in their car and I was sure they were either gonna murder me in my sleep or I made this terrible mistake. What was I doing, a single woman alone, 
opening up my home to strangers. And I stood there in the guest bedroom. And first I thought about them living in their car and how difficult that might be. And then I spotted my copy of Shalom Y'all on the bookshelf and it jogged a memory. In the early part of the 20th century, the sisterhoods of synagogues and the Yenta network in the South, where I'm originally from, were always on the lookout. Invitations would be made for dinner and or lodging to Jews traveling in the area, as we might not feel welcome elsewhere. As we know, there were some hotels that didn't want to house Jewish people who might be passing through town. So in the 1950s, my grandmother, Rebecca, heard that an oil man from Texas would be passing through Mobile, Alabama. She invited him over for dinner and then another dinner. And my grandmother also had an ulterior motive. Those dinners led to a marriage and that oil man is now my uncle Herbie from Waco. <laughs> Was I being an offered an opportunity to follow in her footsteps? minus the shida, it seemed wrong to have an empty bedroom with approximately 4,800 youths on the street in my city. You know, it's just such a funny thing that that memory came to me at that moment, but that really is one of those things that stays with you. And that's why I think, as someone said to me once, when you know where you're from, you know where you're going to. How do we let our history inform us? And that experience of housing these young people really changed my life. I was continually reminded about how much privilege I had. You know, I think about us as being marginalized in the South because we were so small, but what we had was a network you know, that was very strong, a strong family network. Um, there weren't tremendous resources, but family members pulled together and made sure that everyone in the family got to go to college, whether you, your parents were paying for it or your cousin's parents were paying for it. We were all dedicated towards moving that family forward. And, you know, that's a privilege that even as marginalized people has been now generationally passed down through me and to understand the impact of immigrants who are coming into our country now and people who don't have that generational support and the support network of the kind of tight community that the Jewish community was in the South really became a call to action to me to get involved in the unhoused youth community in Los Angeles. And that's all just from being a little girl from Mobile, a little Jewish girl from Mobile. Um, but I wanted to now read a little bit about my family's deep history. Um, you know, the funny thing is, I really didn't understand how we came to America or what our story was until Katrina happened. When Katrina hit, of course, like I think as many of us who, um, you know, uh, have these memories of either we were here or we, well, where were we when we heard this was happening to this part of the country? We were family and friends and, you know, are so deeply invested. And I was in Connecticut at, at a hotel on a vacation and I turned the TV on seeing what's happening. And my dad calls me and what, where are our family? What's happening? And, and suddenly I just felt this this thing in my, again, like this epigenetic thing in my DNA, like what's happening to the place I come from, but I really didn't know the history. And that's started uh, a process of my investigating my family history. And of course it wasn't at all what I expected. And so I wrote this history and I did write it also, you know, why? Why, again, is it important to share this history? I feel like sharing the immigrant history, our immigrant history, again, is important at a time when this book came out, wherever you go, there they are. Alabama had just passed restrictions on 
um, how many Syrian immigrants could come into the country. And I thought, God, this is a Shonda. You know, what would have happened to us if we hadn't been able to come and find a place for ourselves? So one of the reasons I wrote this wasn't just because I thought, oh, this is a really colorful history of my past, because it, it's pretty darn colorful. It involves bootlegging and prostitution. I think that's, and gambling. I hit all the, all the taboo subjects. But the reason I wrote it was in particular to affirm our commitment to welcoming the stranger, which is definitely a theme and a theme in maybe all of our immigrant stories. Okay, so this is a little bit about my family's Southern Jewish experience. More than 2 million Eastern European Jews arrived between 1887 and the start of World War II. Most arrived at Ellis Island, looking like a bus and truck touring company of Fiddler on the Roof, with nothing more than a letter vouching for them from a family member who'd already arrived in the US, the clothes on their back, and a case of dysentery, cholera, or TB. While the majority settled in big Northern cities like New York and Philadelphia, Others entered the country through Boston or southern ports like Charleston and Mobile, all of which is documented in this museum. In fact, the Jewish population of Mobile has never been greater than it was in 1918 with over 2,200 Jews. Now, by all accounts, my ancestors, Shlomo Yehuda Rips, who went by the anglicized name Harry Rips, and my grandmother, Rebecca's father, came, that was my grandmother, Rebecca's father, came to this country after his brother, a furrier in Russia, found work tanning leather along the Mississippi and sent word back that money could be made in America. Great grandpa Harry brought over his sons, settling first in Pritchard, Alabama, and then eventually in Mobile. Ever wonder what kind of people would send their children alone on perilous journeys across the globe to better their fortunes? My people. Harry's wife, Goldie, died in Russia, and there wasn't money to send for my grandmother, Rebecca, and her sister, Frida. Yes, great-grandmother's name was Goldie, very close to Golda, the matriarch and fiddler. They just don't make these things up. They took them from reality. Now, the girls my grandmother and her sister Frida were less valuable as workers to him. So they were either farmed out to other family members or placed in orphanages. A few years later, their brothers begged Harry to send for their sisters and young Rebecca and Frida made the journey across the ocean on a steamship by themselves, most likely in steerage. We really don't know how old Rebecca was when she arrived. She might've been 10 or 12, we think she shaved a few years off her age in order to be good marriage material. But as she neared 60, she claimed to be older to collect social security. Meanwhile, my father's grandfather, Bert Gerwich, and his clan left from the same part of Eastern Europe. Family lore says they had tickets on the Lusitania, but missed the boat, lucky for me. Now Bert, was a welder in the shipyards. So the family followed the work in the busiest coastal cities, starting in Quincy, Massachusetts, then moving south to Chickasaw, Alabama, and later Pritchard in Mobile. Malcolm Gladwell wrote about climbing the crooked ladder of success for immigrant families. Immigrant families working to become respectable pillars of the society often worked on the margins. This is what he meant by climbing the crooked ladder to success. And these climbers aim wasn't the establishment of a criminal empire. It was simply the advancement of the clan. And that's exactly what my ancestors who didn't have higher education or inherited wealth did. They pooled their resources. They opened dry goods stores, pawn shops, and they intermarried. There were very few Jewish people in Mobile who weren't in business or related or both in those early years. And here's how the two families teamed up together. 
great grandpa Bert's welding skills were invaluable to maintaining local bootlegger stills. And great grandpa Harry had ties with ship captains because his dry goods store stocked the, what was called slop chests. And those slop chests were essentially a ship's general store uh, for the vessels docking in Mobile. Now, sugar is one of the key ingredients in making moonshine. So the bootleggers were always looking for ways to score sugar. Wet was one of the biggest imports in Mobile. Now, if the bags of sugar got wet during the journey from the southern ports, they were deemed unsaleable, but the bootleggers didn't mind damp sugar. So Bert enlisted Harry's help, who, because of his relationships with the captains, had become a broker of the sticky stuff, earning him the nickname Sugar. Funny thing, once Bert and Sugar were in league together with the bootleggers, a lot of bags of sugar were suddenly showing up wet on the docks of Mobile. Bert's son, Isaac, was introduced to Sugar's daughter, Rebecca. My future grandparents got married. So yes, I owe my life to moonshine. Now Bert's wife, Rose, my great grandmother, the one who prayed every time she ate a piece of shellfish, she was an enterprising broad. She sold moonshine in a pickle barrel in her store. You would tap a sterling silver cup attached to a barrel with twine, pay 10 cents, and she'd pour you a cup. Same cup for everyone. It was probably her kiddish cup. Now, Rose and Bert lived next to a couple, the Kerfits. And as she said, they were called circus people. Now, in our family, any mention of someone's family included the word people, referring to what they did for a living, which could range from banking people to farm people. And you would always say, well, who are their people? And they weren't Jewish, so the great-grandparents didn't socialize with the Kerfits, but there was any chance to make what they call make a quick dollar, as they say in my family, was another story. So Rose, after she would close the shop for the day, would stand with her jug of moonshine and silver cup in the hallway at the Kerfits place and, showed, and sold shots to women waiting in line to get their fortunes told by Mrs. Kerfit. Apparently, the more they drank, the more time they'd spend with Mrs. Kerfitz. So it was a mutually beneficial relationship. And if they heard some particularly bracing content, Rose would sell them another shot on the way out. My cousins have made me take a blood oath not to write that Rose ran a brothel but she did rent out rooms behind her store to a cadre of ladies of the evening. And no one in the family disputes that during the 1950s, all the boys in the family would drop in on Edna's joint. And when Edna would answer the door, you'd say, the Gerwitches sent me. And she'd show you right in. The depression hit my family hard and even though prohibition had ended in 1933 and Alabama was one of the 17 states that continued to tightly control alcoholic distribution. Oh, this is a little bit of a story about what my family did during, so, so once the bootlegging was out of, was that, when that, when the bootlegging era ended, they had to adapt like you do. So I'll read a little bit about this. In the very early hours of the day, my father, who was in elementary school, marked the sidewalk outside their home with an X in chalk. It was a signal sometimes referred to as the hobo code amongst the unemployed that work was available. Hard up locals would line up to pick blackberries on my family's land in exchange for white bread and bologna sandwiches and cups of coffee that my dad would serve before going to school and make on the porch. The family used the blackberries to make bathtub wine. Dad says the sound of corks popping as the wine fermented would wake them all through the night. And even my dad had his own job. 
he and his cousin Billy collected scrap metal in dad's little red wagon and sold it to local scrap metal dealers. Sometimes this scrap metal was copper piping harvested from crawl spaces that eight-year-old boys were just small enough to access under people's homes. Everyone, and this is a little bit about life in Mobile, everyone in the family played cards. The private clubs in Mobile were restricted to Jews and Mobile wasn't exactly a cultural hub. So gambling was one of the few forms of entertainment in those days. There were illegal casinos along the Mississippi and games hosted at private homes. The men installed slot machines, these hand-cranked levers, earning them the name one-armed bandits in the Jewish progressive club. The men played gin and my grandmother, Rebecca, Rose and our uh, Aunt Annie, who was the matriarch of the family, had an ongoing poker game. Word is that they were all viciously competitive. They formed secret alliances. There was rampant cursing and they were unrepentant cheaters. They would play for pennies. They'd lift from the pushki jar, the charity collection jar. My dad says, that Rose taught him to play poker and shoot craps when he was five, and I don't doubt that. What's going on? I said one day when I discovered my father and my five-year-old crowding around a corner of the living room while on a visit to my parents' home in Florida. Grandpa's teaching me to play craps, my son gleefully exclaimed. My father had presented him with a legacy gift a set of hand-carved ivory dice and a leather cup given to him by Rose. Now, I had met Rose myself, but when I met Rose, I was lucky enough to meet my great-grandmother. Near the end of her life, she was a kindly old lady, five feet tall at most. She wore house dresses, orthopedic shoes, and wire rim glasses. She spoke only Yiddish, but always kissed our cheeks and handed out hard candies to all of us grandchildren from a cut glass candy bowl in her modest home. I would never have pegged her as a potty mouth moonshiner in league with prostitutes. So that's a little bit about my family's history. I wanted to read one more thing, which is about uh, my grandmother, who is just one of the great influences in my life. Um, at a certain point, my family, you wanna show the picture? You know, uh, we went from a dry goods store, from the little store with the pickle barrel to Ike's clothing store, which was, uh, I think that there's, you can, if you do some deep Googling on the internet, you can still find like an old advertisement of like a fine place to buy clothes for the discerning man. And my grandmother, who she, she had a, a sense of drama that perhaps she could only develop in the South. Uh, she, she was the buyer and she, she really considered herself a fashionista. She was really a force of nature. And uh, we have photographs of Rebecca modeling clothes from Ike's clothing store. And we share a laugh, my cousins and I share a laugh about how our grandmother liked to think of herself as fashion forward. Every picture of her is carefully posed. She stands like I always do now at a slimming angle, never straightforward, always making sure to keep her chin lifted one foot forward featuring her slender ankles. She went on buying trips to New York every year. She stayed at the New Yorker Hotel. There are rumors in the family that she might have had a boyfriend there <laughs> who was a distant cousin. <laughs> she even claimed that Elvis once played musical accompaniment at one of her fashion shows and the timing would have been possible. We also have a picture of her from when she was the president of Mobile Women's Business League. She took classes to prepare for that in Robert's Rules of Order. Everyone in Mobile says she was always ahead of her time. But even more than being a fashionista, she was a Jewish mother. 
And everyone has a story about my grandmother who, first of all, she always told all of us we were all her favorite. She also told us that we should always stay close to the family and that when we were together, we were in the bosom of our family. We were always in a bosom. It was very bosomy. <laughs> But everyone has a story about her. And this is what my cousin Sandy said. Every, here's my favorite memory of your grandmother. When my mother-in-law was in the hospital, we were all visiting with her. And all of a sudden, this amazing smell is coming towards us. And Rebecca bursts into the room with bags of mouth-watering food she'd been cooking all day for us. She had stuffed cabbages, her famous sweet and sour meatballs, her fried chicken and banana bread. She even bought, brought plates and silverware with her. Now, when I moved, it was, it was shocking and upsetting when I went to North to go to NYU to go to college. She was very upset about that because uh, I had gone too far north and she would send care packages to my dorm. And, you know, there were, you can imagine, you know, having been born earlier in the century, even, you know, phones that she could call me on the long distance. It was always the long distance. It was still shocking and she would never want to talk for a long time because it was expensive. But the idea of how food would travel it was very important she had to keep sending me those sweet and sour meatballs and the stuffed cabbages from Atlanta to my dorm. And I would always know when her packages would arrive because they would come and whoever was working behind the desk would <laughs> me because, you know, it, they, it, they didn't arrive in a cold pack, but... <laughs> I knew, I knew, you know, that the feeling behind it was, was so strong and, and so wonderful. And in this book, I write about, this is just how much it's always in my mind. I write about one of the stories in this book. Now this book takes place um, after my kid went off to college and I'm getting a divorce and things have changed in my life. And this book is about adapting to new normals and what I thought was going to be an empty nest that was never actually emptied. Um, but uh, in particular, I write about my grandmother, Rebecca, because one of these stories is about when you realize you've gotten to an age where you are becoming a family elder and how shocking that was and how I didn't know how I was going to do that because I'm not someone who cooks and I could only, part of being a family elder in my family was always bringing, you know, you, you've got to, you've got to bring the, the you know, the, the food to, to all of the family occasions. And I, I just, I have a little description of that, that I was, I wanted to read. And I think it's on, hey, I, I've marked it right here. Uh, I think some of you will relate to this. This was my worst fear. Was my the biggest sin in my family is that I've always shown up without homemade provisions. At family meals, card games, coffee clatches, or any gathering of more than one person, my grandmother Rebecca rolled in with her legendary meatball, stuffed cabbages, and enough banana bread to feed a small army. And people in my family have kept up this tradition. My nephew, Max, once brined a turkey and carried it on a plane, cradling it like an infant. Some people fly with service animals. The Gerwiches travel with pies, kugel, and three bean salads. My sister, the CEO of a worldwide charity, regularly makes her own risotto from scratch. Me, everyone in my family knows, I don't cook, I heat. I prefer to travel with a neck pillow. So, you know, this, she's always a, an important figure in my life. Um, and and I, I, uh, I, I, I love to entertain readers with those stories. I have one more little section. If you wanted to, I could read that a little bit about our family and our family's cemetery <laughs> in my 
Mobile, but I could also tell you that story too. You know, uh, one of the things that's so great about this museum is, you know, you get the history of how we brought our culture, our religion over, uh, and yet, you know, when as it went in Mobile, even with a relatively small people when they first arrived, they formed both a synagogue and a temple. You know, small community, but couldn't agree. And uh, whenever I go back to Mobile, I always go and visit my family. And it's, it's so funny. I mean, families have their own particular um, cultures and um, the families who founded the Spring Hill Temple their cemetery is this beautiful, sunlit, uh, expansive area. My family, who founded the Ahavis Hesed Synagogue, they are in death as they were in life, like a shtetl. <laughs> they are on top of each other in this little area. And you know, there's the Jewish tradition of leaving a stone on top to show that you have visited on top of a memorial stone. When I went to visit last, there were dice. On top of a memorial stone and Mardi Gras beads. And it's just part of my dad's legacy. I do think that my being a storyteller, this is something I inherited from him, but also, uh, you know, uh, there was the last words of both my mother and several cousins were your father he knew how to have a good time which is why when i was little we always had an apartment on charles street because new orleans was a place where we had a good time <laughs> so that's a little bit about my family history a little about my southern jewish experience and I would love to open this up to any questions you might have uh, about either being a writer or a performer or being a Jewish girl from Mobile. Yes. We have a question from online. Uh -huh. um, and I also am going to let the folks in person know that if you have a question, put your hand up, I will walk to you and you can ask it in the microphone so that folks online can also hear you. Fixing uh my bra. <laughs> Um, so Lee Botner asks, are you related to Bert and Janet Gerwich, who I knew in Knoxville? <laughs> he runs around. That is the most Jewish question, right? I, mean, I could be giving a presentation on quantum physics. And the first question would be, are you related to? <laughs> yes, of course I'm related to Cookie and Bert. <laughs> Those are my first cousins. You know, and it's um, it's such a funny thing, you know, uh, like I said, we we all we still keep this close connection because of our small numbers in Mobile, and the small town nature of that life as actually um, my uh, as Cookie uh, Janet's uh, uh, cousin Sandy used to say, she would say when there was a wedding. You didn't need an invitation. You knew you were invited. I mean, it was a small group. And that can be bad because everyone knows everything about you. But it was also very tight. And people, you know, these were my dad's closest friends. I mean, the stories of the trouble he got into with Bert and Cookie. Oof. I will, I, I've actually been sworn to secrecy about some of that. Um, but yes, those are my cousins. And now about quantum physics. Yeah. Well, after you talk about quantum physics, um, if you could talk a little bit more about your activism, uh, particularly with the Lung Association, and are there other affiliations that you have worked for? I'm Barbara Kaplinsky, by the way. Oh, Barbara, thank you for asking me that. So, you know, um, I, I do think of it as this something is just in our DNA. Um, my cousin Renee, another one of our Gerwich girls, Renee Wizig Barrios, she's um, also from Mobile. Uh, she's just recently been uh, made the director and CEO of the, of the Jewish Federation of, in Houston. Uh, my cousin Robin Gerwich, Dr. Robin Gerwich uh, at Duke uh, is one of the leading uh, psych, psych, uh, researchers and doctors who work with childhood traumas and she sent in after 
tragedies happen involving children in school shootings and, you know, internationally, somehow there's just something that is just thread through our DNA of this call to service. And I think it was at certain point when I, you know, had been uh, acting in television for years where I started to realize I could also uh, have, you know, not when every waking moment wasn't involved in building a career, I could start lending my name and person and hours to help community building. And um, my first involvement in activism was on an environmental level. And some of that was actually inspired by being from this part of the country, which is at such danger from um, climate, as we're calling it now, climate emergency and sea level rise and coastal erosion, because I inherited land on a barrier island on Dauphin Island in outside of Mobile. And uh, when at, during Katrina, when I learned of the devastation to that island and my family's long history there, um, I started to get involved in the sustainability movement in bringing education and um, awareness. And uh, I hosted a show for three years on the Discovery Channel, Planet Green, about uh, instituting not only uh, uh, recycling and reusing things in the household, but how uh, we could pair the idea of sustainability with affordability uh, and working with small, uh, with households and small businesses as a, as a social experiment um, and suggesting things like for there was a fraternity in Newark that I worked with that we not only got them to use not only recycled um, uh, products in the fraternity house and to lower their um, the amount of energy they were pulling into the house through unneeded electrical appliances, but to institute family style meals as a way of creating less waste. That was my first real engagement in activism. And then as I write about in this book, I got involved really inadvertently in the unhoused community and in advocacy uh, for um, unhoused youth. And one of the things that I, I learned about in this book that I also feel is so pertinent to us sitting here and to the larger Jewish community is I didn't realize until I had this experience of living with people under my own roof of who was becoming um, unhoused in America and how vulnerable and how fine that line is uh, and how few uh, safety nets are in place now. And of course, with the increased you know, wage gap, uh, this, is, this is, I mean, we know this is a scourge in our country right now, but I didn't realize how much I had otherized people. And I think that's really pertinent to Jewish people and really all everyone, but I, I think we understand what that's like. And I, I learned so much myself. So, you know, um, one of my, okay, I'm going to break my anonymity with this now, but one of my favorite things but in that I do along with the more public work I do is um, I, I help run the clothing closet now at the organization, A Safe Place for Youth, that sponsored what's called a host home program. And when you read this book, you'll read about the host home program, one of which is how I was matched with that unhoused uh, couple. Um, this this, this uh, model, the host home programs, when I did it, and I wrote about in the book, is it was in 11 cities across the country. It's in more than 40 cities now across the US. It has tremendously high rate of success in helping bridge that gap between um, being unhoused and finding permanent housing for young people. And in particular, what I find so inspiring now is the, you know, this is a, a intervention for housing that doesn't involve building infrastructure. 
if you have an extra bedroom, you are not safe around me because I know how to fill it. Um, but uh, one of the really inspiring things about it is it's being expanded into states like here we are, excuse me, in Louisiana, uh, it started in urban centers. And one of the goals is to bring the host home program to more rural communities at, so that we can um, stem the flow of people overtaxing services in urban communities and help people who might want to stay closer to where they might have ties, you know? Uh, and so this is, but I, I, um, I help run the clothing closet there and, what I, I love about it is when I'm there, I'm, I'm not Annabelle Gerwich, a Jewish girl from Mobile. I'm just volunteer lady. And uh, I just get to help these young people keep some dignity by picking out outfits, you know, of clothes, because it's so hard to keep track of your things when you are unhoused. And, you know, we also consider unhoused. It's amazing how many college students, this is where we don't you know, this sometimes an invisible problem, college students who are couch surfing or living in their cars on campus, it's really shocking and upsetting. And so um, I get to help uh, them to stay clothed. Uh, if you've been following my recent work, I've been writing in the New York Times and in the Washington Post about how during COVID, I was diagnosed with lung cancer went in for a COVID test and I walked out with lung cancer and uh, it has been, was complete shock. Um, I didn't know that anyone with lungs can get lung cancer, whether you're a smoker or not a smoker. And so I've gotten very involved. A lung cancer happens to be incredibly underfunded. It has a high mortality rate. It is incredibly underfunded. And, uh, there's so much great emerging science. And I am here today because of these biomarker targeted therapies. So uh, I'm intent on sticking around for a while longer. I just actually was in a at a conference in Charlotte meeting with the organization that I work with, the Lung Cancer Foundation of America. They're specifically focused on uh, research and they fund what they call the Young Investigators Science Fund. And it particularly funds um, female scientists and uh, scientists um, of color, because this is a group of scientists who are have, have been less funded. And I'm so proud of our organization. We We are helping to change that uh, by funding these scientists no pressure on them, but the clock is ticking. Um, but it's it's really important to um, uh, also, I feel that I want to talk about the importance of, um, it was particularly important for me during COVID to talk about not uh, ignoring any symptoms you might have and stopping going to the doctor. I think a lot of us are still falling out of the habit of taking care of ourselves because we got very comfortable at home or, or uh, I shouldn't say, com I mean, comfortable. We, we just stopped, you know, engaging for many good reasons, uh, but also, you know, we fell behind in our healthcare. That's statistically something we know still exists. So, um, you know, I, I want to use my own story and my own little cough that I ignored to make sure people know that you don't have to smoke to get lung cancer. So that's my, that's my new cause. Thank you. Do we have more questions in the audience at this moment? Um, we do have one online. I'm gonna get mm -hmm. a little closer. Yes, they are my cousins. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, would you mind sharing a story about the, about a time that, um, sorry, my eyes, about a time that you had to explain more about being a, a Southern Jew in your travels, perhaps in LA or, you know, New York or wherever, where it kind of that thing, sorry, like 
bashed. You know, where your Southern Jewish identity came to light. Oh, gosh. Uh, I'm trying to think of a specific example. Uh, if you can find it in my work, I probably have written something. Um, but, uh, you know, there is something I forgot to mention that I, I wanted to talk about. And, you know, I'm trying to do, you know, my part in sharing this uh, I don't want to say it's a forgotten history because none of us have forgotten it, uh, but it's an under-recognized history. But I wanted to recommend one of the greatest pieces of entertainment that's been created in the, in the last hundred years in America, um, which comes from Tony Kushner. Uh, and it's, um, I'm sure you can find scenes from it. I don't think the entire thing is... Uh, is online, but um, Caroline or Change is one of the greatest musicals, along with his iconic work, Angels in America. I mean, I feel I'm so honored to be pictured next to Tony Kushner here in the museum because there's Lillian Hellman. There's some, you know, there's there's a great contribution of Southern Jews in the arts, um, but Tony Kushner is a little bit unmatched. And why is Caroline or change so important? What's so extraordinary about this work? And I'm, I'm answering this question slightly because I feel like he's done a better job than me of portraying life uh, and, and the history of and using his Southern Jewish background for social change. So Caroline or change um, exists as a story from Tony Kushner's youth in Lake Charles, Louisiana, and, and his remembrance as a child of the woman who was in service to his family as their maid, who was in the story, Carolina Change, uh, a single mother of four, trying to make earn, you know, ends meet, living at this time, I believe it takes place in the 1960s. It's such an extraordinary portrayal and what Tony Kushner did by not only telling, he's telling the story of his Jewish family, but then he had the brilliance and the imagination to ask, thinking back on this memory, what was the life of this woman who was in service to his family like? And that's the Caroline character. What was what was her experience? And it, the, the musical and the story is unsparing and it's so beautiful and heartbreaking and funny. And there's a crazy coincidence here, which is that as a young actress, I was a cherub in the Northwestern University program, summer program. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, Barbara Sun was in that program too. And I happened to uh, do that on a summer coming from, uh, you know, high school. And I met an actress, a young woman whose name is Tanya Pinkins. Tanya and I both stayed in the arts. Tanya uh, collaborated. Uh, Tony Kushner wrote this musical with Tanya, my best friend still since I was 15 in mind. And Tanya Pinkins and Tony Kushner collaborated to flesh out Caroline's life. Tanya was nominated for a Tony for that per, uh, performance in Carolina Change. It was maybe the most extraordinary thing I've ever seen. Um, she later won a Tony for Jelly's Last Jam. She's won every award imaginable. I'm so proud of her. But I think one of the most extraordinary things is that collaboration in telling Caroline's story. And so Caroline or Change has done more than anything, I think, than anyone has done for portraying that Southern Jewish experience in a way that also encompasses looking at responsibility and, and, and taking you know, social action now and re-understanding re that story. It's done more than I could ever do. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that things like that and things like the Lehman Trilogy, which if you haven't seen that, find a production to go and see. Um, that's a story about the Lehman brothers and their 
uh, start in Alabama. And it's and that's been a huge hit on Broadway. And I saw it in Los Angeles. And it's funny because, you know, we're always re-understanding history. And my dad always told a story that in the family was always discounted because there was also the feeling in my family, like, well, if Harry tells a story, don't believe it's true. And um, he told me a story that uh, when he was maybe, you know, 12 years old, he and other boys in the family were recruited by the Lehman brothers, sent to New York and put up in a nice hotel. And they were sent to the docks to pack what was labeled farm equipment, but was actually munitions that were sent um, as the state of Israel was being formed. And they were packing off munitions to support this effort in Israel. Now, everyone in the family always said, I don't know if that story is true. And I wasn't sure about it, but then when I understood, and I didn't know the history of the Lehman family, when I understood their connection with Alabama, I suddenly realized, you know, I think that story has is probably uh, has probably true. Maybe not, but I it, it it got a lot more true at least in in my mind. But uh, I think we're beginning to see more stories come out in a larger way. I think that's my last story. Unless there are any other questions, I'm going to sign some books. Fantastic. So I am going to. Thank you so much for your fantastic talk today, Annabelle. It was, it was wonderful to hear your experiences um, and get to share it with this community here and online. I'm gonna quickly tell the folks online that you too can order a uh, signed copy of Annabelle's book. The um, Tomorrow you'll get a uh, link in an email that, um, is connected to our MSJE store um, and you can order your book. You can get a 10% discount if you use that registration code in your email. Um, if you would like to keep up with us, which we hope you all will, you can follow us on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, and Instagram. Um, and keep an eye out for events that are happening um, in the next few months here at the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience. We so appreciate everybody online um, and with that, we can shut the online part off.